and welcome back to Automotive Logistics and Supply Chain Europe Live. I'm Rich Logan, Senior Content Producer at Automotive Logistics and Ultima Media. Uh, we're deep into the event now, but we've still got plenty more content to delve into uh, with some fantastic guests on their way. Digital, uh, the digital age has arrived and the opportunity for greater control uh, across the supply chain is within your grasp. Uh, joining me for this session are three experts with very different backgrounds, each bringing an important perspective when it comes to digital transformation and harnessing the potential of digital supply chains. So welcoming onto the stage, we have uh, Per Olaf Arnas, strategic logistics expert at Einride, uh, Selma Meyer, uh, responsible for global material management for aftermarket at CNH Industrial, and Alan Duncan, Senior Industry Strategy Director of Manufacturing uh, for EMEA at Blue Yonder. Great to have you here. Thanks so much. And before I get stuck into uh, my questions, I just want to uh, encourage the audience to uh, get involved in a couple of polls we've launched. Um, so the first one we're asking is, when does your company plan to have a fully digitalized supply chain? And the answers you can choose from are, we're already there, one to two years, three to five years, six to 10 years, or never, Excel spreadsheets forever. Uh, and the other poll that we'd like to get your perspectives on are, uh, which trends are transforming your business the most over the next 24 months? Connected vehicles, shared mobility, electric cars, or recovery from COVID. So those polls are now live and my colleagues uh, should be pointing that out to you on, our, on the chat. So please do engage and we'll be addressing those later in the session. But enough of that, enough of me. Let's crack on with uh, meeting our guests. So um, Per Olaf, uh, great to have you here. Um, for those in our audience who may not be so familiar with Einride uh, and may not have seen the uh, exciting videos of your autonomous pods, uh, racing around the, the Top Gear track uh, recently. Can you give us a brief introduction to the, uh, to the company and tell us a little bit about your role? Thank you, thank you. Uh, Enride is a five-year-old company. We uh, were formed to um, accelerate the transformation to a sustainable and autonomous transport system, because that's where we think we must go in order to meet um, the global sustainability targets that we see. And what we do is we are uh, developing an autonomous vehicle called, we are calling it the pod, uh, autonomous electric transport vehicles, which is basically a truck without a driver's cabin. And it's autonomous level four, meaning that it can do most of the things by itself, but we can also remotely control it. From an office somewhere, there will be a remote driver that can control this vehicle. And this driver can, of course, control many vehicles during a day. And one vehicle can be controlled by many drivers during one day. So this is a decoupling of, of the ancient paradigm that the driver follows the vehicle. And we are also going electric. So uh, we also have uh, traditional trucks in our fleet uh, doing real transport work with real customers today. But they are, of course, fully electric. So um, all of these we tie together uh, with a digital platform, because if you want to go electric and mean uh, mean something by it, you quickly realize that you have to embrace complexity instead of reducing complexity, which is the norm or has been in the in the freight sector for for a hundred years, really. So um, uh, at our core, we have a digital brain, the uh, the uh, mobility freight mobility platform that is optimized to handle the complexities of electric fleets. And if we do that correctly, these fleets will be uh, less costly than the uh, old 20th century version of fleets that like we did in 1990s with uh, diesel trucks. So that's a little bit about us. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Per Olaf. And, uh, and just, just sticking with you uh, a, a little bit, I'm right just Itself as a digital first company. Um, can you explain a little bit by what you mean by this? And uh, you've already touched upon the, the strategy, um, but you know, where do you see the real value in choosing this over maybe an asset focused, uh, more traditional model that we see in the automotive industry? 
Well, this is a traditional S curve where where the, the the old style transportation system has reached the saturation level, where where it has fully stagnated in its development. We see that in Sweden, where I'm from, we see that R and D spending for in the transport sector has gone down eighty percent in the last four years, because there is nothing more to improve. That system has been made as efficient as, as uh, it's possible uh, during the hundred years it has existed. So um, when we are uh, a digital first company, it means that we are fully data driven in what we do. And the physical resources that we put into play are not put into play because we need physical resources. They are put into play because the data tells us that we need them. So it's a very different take than the old postal service companies, for instance, that have their resources, they have their terminals, they have their vehicles, and their main their main agenda is to fill the system with goods so that they can pay off their fixed costs. And uh, we have um, we have the opportunity of starting with a blank slate. Since we are a startup, we don't have to have the legacy technology with us, so we can leapfrog into the future. So that that's a bit about how we think about things. Yeah, very interesting, and I think we'll we'll come back to that. Uh, that clean slate uh, in a bit. I want to pick your brains on that. But uh, we're moving to uh, to Selma. Um, great to have you here. And uh, going from one uh, one end of the extreme to the other in terms of uh, a startup with a blank slate uh, um, to a traditional player, traditional company, um, traditional player in the agriculture and commercial vehicle sector. Can you tell us a little a little bit about digital supply chains and CN? Uh, CNH uh, and the transformational journey that you're on uh, right now. Yes, sure. Hello. Uh, in CNH, we started this journey of digitalization a long time ago, many years ago. Uh, we produce heavy equipment, as you said, for construction, agriculture, and commercial vehicles. Uh, one of the first uh, we started uh, developing the digitalization with the products. And uh, today with the connected machines, telematics, and all the capabilities that we have in our products, we look uh, for look at for some opportunities in using this immense quantity of data to improve our customer experience in terms of forecasting and planning. Uh, we have a big complexity. We have more than 500,000 part numbers uh, that we need to deal with in the aftermarket. We have more than 45 depots around the world. So uh, with the opportunity to combine the digital information that we get from our products in our system and make this uh, available in our forecast, in our demand planning, will give us much more visibility of our customer needs in different markets, in different uh, conditions, in, in different uh, seasonality. So, so this journey started with um, with the products uh, and then it was coming. Now we have in all our departments, in all our areas in CNH, different initiatives. And in the aftermarket, we have this integration of the data starting now with this, the new tool that I would, I would describe a little bit uh, later in, in, the, in our conversation. But uh, it's a very exciting journey that we are living now here in, in the company. Yeah, absolutely. and. Uh, uh, I'm interested to uh, to dive right in right at the beginning of that journey in terms of uh, there'll be many uh, people within our audience uh, on digital transformation journeys themselves, um, like uh, CNH, um, working with those legacy systems. And I'll, I'll be interested to sort of delve into a little bit of the, the case, uh, the business case uh, and investment decisions kind of driving this. Obviously, CNH, a huge company, this requires formidable um, resources and uh, investment in time, um, as well as bringing on partners, which we'll come to in a minute, Alan. Uh, yeah, can you talk us through some of uh, the, the decision processes that, that went into that? Yes, sure. Uh, it was done almost three years ago in the, for the aftermarket specifically, where uh, we started discussing and looking for uh, alternatives in the market where we could combine exactly this opportunity to using the information that we have from our products, information from the park, the uh, predictive maintenance contracts and so on in a system, in a tool that would be able to integrate everything and then give us a better uh, demand uh, visibility uh, and also 
to to uh, create uh, and leverage better the coverage of the stocks with the uh, demand in the different regions. So when we went to the market, we made this research. We found several uh, options. We decided for the one that uh, we are now in the phase of the go live, which is a tool from blue, from blue yonder. It's a advanced planning tool. Uh, it's a, a quite huge investment, uh, but in that moment we approve it exactly because we saw a lot of opportunities. First is the customer experience because managing such a big complexity in terms of SKUs is very difficult uh, to have the right part in the right place. And uh, when we talk about harvesting, we sometimes have very short windows, so the the machine uptime is very important. So we made this uh, analysis of the return of investment. We also uh, saw big opportunity to reduce inventory because with a better for forecasting plan, we are able to have a better uh, balance between capital spending and service. Uh, and again, it is very complex aftermarket. When we talk about aftermarket, we're talking about uh, half a million of SKUs and of those 70% are what we call slow movers parts that we may use just once a year, once every two years. So so uh, the, the forecast accuracy is, is something very important for us. So the integration of all this data, we prepared a business case. We were very lucky to have this approved. Last year with the pandemic coming, it was discussed again, all on the table uh, and we discussed it internally, but this one was, um, kept, let's say, uh, and we are very, very happy now because we are in the face of the goal life. Uh, the, the struggle for sure was to implement, to, to make the integration in an agile approach of all this complexity, a global system for all our aftermarket during the pandemic period where we could not travel. Everything, all the sprints were, were done remotely. So it was a very big challenge, but uh, with the support of, of Blue Yonder, I would say, uh, we were able to, to reach the first milestone because now we, we are still in the first milestone in the go life of the first wave. But the, the decision was driven especially uh, by the customer satisfaction, the customer centric approach that we have in CNH. Right, and uh, I think that customer-centric approach we can delve into more. But um, you mentioned Blue Yonder being being fantastic partners. Let's bring Alan um, uh, into into the conversation. Uh, clearly, you're working with, with CNH in terms of digital transformation. It's a hot topic right now. But is it mainly theory in automotive? Is, is there a reality? Um, are, are most people on this journey. Uh, what are you seeing from your perspective? Well, thanks for that, Rich. Um, I think what we are seeing across automotive and, and many other sectors is that the, the pandemic has accelerated companies' efforts to digitize their supply chains. And I think the, the driver for that was to mainly to plug the holes in the supply chains that were exposed during that very difficult period. Now, hopefully we're, we're on our way out of it, but uh, you know the period last year where Factories were closed. Uh, you know, customers didn't know whether they were coming or going, and so lots of uncertainty created lots of disruption, and and that drove people to accelerate their their, their efforts to to digitize supply chains. I think in in the areas of end-to-end um, -end visibility and plugging the the process gaps between planning and execution. Have been have been key, and, and a move towards a more autonomous supply chain is certainly playing out in in reality. And if you you, know, you listen to what Selma is saying about the connected machine and and taking data off the the end equipment and using that to drive your supply chain, it's certainly uh, way way beyond theory now and and very much reality. But what what I think we're seeing is companies are eager to gain control of their supply chain outside of the normal four walls of the, the ERP. You know, now, you know, we still work with companies who have a, a mixture of ERP systems, or even if they've standardized on one ERP, they, they often aren't very well uh, integrated or consistent. Uh, but what we're finding is that with modern platform solutions, uh, you don't need to put the effort into integrating the ERP to the same extent. 
you can write above that. And so that's helping the transformation without going through the enormous effort of re-implementing an ERP. So beyond the four walls has been uh, where we, we see most activity, whether it's upstream uh, to suppliers or downstream to, to vendors. And I think automotive is, um, is absolutely uh, on that journey as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, uh, per, per Olive, go, going back to you, you talked about that clean slate. Um, uh, obviously, you're, you're multi-sector as well. So, uh, you know, what, what do you see when you uh, approach the transportation industry, logistics and supply chains? Uh, what's your perspective uh, coming at it through it from a, a futurist perspective, I suppose? Well, I've been active in, in, in that industry. Actually, I had my first job in 1988 as a dispatcher at the local haulage company. And I've been, I've, been all my, I've been a researcher also for the last decade looking into the digital development of the sector. And one thing that strikes me uh, now is when I talk to, and this could be CEOs of fairly large haulage companies, they are still inside the box. They are still looking at the system that they have grown up with and the system they have nurtured all these years. And they are looking on how to make that system more polished, more effective, more efficient, and so on. And the more I, uh, the more I learn and the more I see about how we can go electric and the electromobility and also the automation potential, the more convinced I am that we actually need the clean slate in order to be able to maximize the usefulness of an electric fleet. And um, I, I'm not sure that a legacy company can make the transformation, uh, not without shedding some blood, I think. Uh, but since we have the clean slate, we don't have to make the mistakes of the past. But we also need to have, um, I mean, since we are moving fast and we are moving first, we run into obstacles, we get branches in our face, we, we, we are trailblazers in a sense. And that, of course, is also something that takes a lot of energy. And you have to double back, you have to choose different paths, you have to be very agile. And agility is maybe not something that the transport industry is famous for. <laughs> uh, so, so um, yeah, this is, I think we are breaking new ground in several different areas. Um, and we are also challenged, of course, of a paradigm that, that sort of has been working for 100 years. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, uh, I think a key word there was uh, is agility. Something that uh, Selma mentioned that she was, uh, you know, was part of the, the thinking behind their their transformation. Um, a provocative point there that uh, those legacy systems maybe can't um, can't be as efficient, can't can't get there as as quickly um, uh, as those starting from a clean slate. Um, and I welcome the, my other panelists, Alan. You work with new, new and, and traditional players. Um, your your comments on this? Your thoughts here? So I, th I mean, I think transformation is difficult. Um, you know, I, I, I like Per Olaf's analogy of, um, of of you know breaking a few few branches. Maybe you want to duck under some Per Olaf and and leave them behind for your competitors to uh, to bash through <laughs> as well. Um, I, I think they. I think we we're at a difficult stage um, in, in digital transformation because, on the one hand, we've got we've got the the boundary breaking um, technologies like machine learning and you know, blue yonder uh, you know has, has has been in that field for a number of years, um, but it's still very um, new to a lot of businesses and. Uh, you know, so, so some see it as, as groundbreaking, some see it as just a, a natural extension of uh, you know, in, improving their, their, their business performance. But there's still the human side to it. And so we need to, we need to balance the, you know, the, 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 the way we approach solving problems and not lose the value of human collaboration, but at the same time, you use those sort of branch breaking um, ideas and, and techniques to, to to bring his efficiencies where it's appropriate. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks. A, a great response there. And um, let's let's move the conversation on a little bit. Uh, you know, 
with, with technology advancing at, at an ever quickening pace, um, a, a question that, that often come, comes to us is, you know, how do you how do you select the right technology? Um, we're seeing it, it, it advance at, at an exponential rate. Um, so how do we know what's coming down further down the line? Um, Selma, you've just made a, a big investment um, into digitalization using specific tools and, and platforms. Um, how, how do we ensure that we're using the right tools and technology and that something better is not going to be coming along in, in a year or two? Um, Selma, perhaps I'll, I'll start with you there. Okay, it, it's very hard to answer this one, Rich, because we always think that we could have to choose something else in our day by day, not only in, in the company. But what we try to ensure when we decided for Blue Yonder was to make a good market research. Uh, we decided because we had a partner which was one of the biggest in the in the industry in the software development for for supply chain, and also what I think is very important is to have a long term contract. In this case, we have a five years contract, meaning that all the enhancements that will be done by Blue Yonder in their system, we will have the opportunity to do and use in our uh, our company. So for me, the most important is the, the benchmark, the research, and also to be sure that the contract will be, will have a long, uh, will have a long-term contract, not just the implementation of this system, because you're right, Rich, uh, from one month to another, things change, we see new technologies coming and so on. So this, this is one of key points to, that we use to make the decision. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I'll go for it, Alan. I think if you. Yeah, I mean, I mean I've, I've been in Selma's position in, in the past as well. And you know, I when I was looking at making technology decisions, I, there were four things I was looking for from a, from a partner. The first and, and and foremost is can it meet my my business functional needs? You know, that that's the baseline. The second then is, is it going to deliver me business value? Um, because we're doing this with a business case and we have some set objectives. And, and so those two fundamentally uh, have to be met. But, but the, the third is particularly important for the, the medium and the long term. And so is the fourth. The third is, is am I uh, making a, a decision about with the appropriate level of risk associated with it? Now, it, I could be conservative and choose something that is established technology, is proven, been around for 20 years, or I could choose technology that is bleeding edge and is, is you know, a, an element of risk. I could choose a company that's been around for 30 years, or I could choose a company that's been around for, for 20 minutes. Um, but I have to make the decision um, knowing what risk profile I'm happy to, uh, to accept. And then the fourth is to make sure that when I'm when I'm entering into this, am I making a decision that is not going to unravel in the next two years? That I'm I'm entering into a long-term partnership because you know I, I have been through what Selma's been uh, going through, and you don't want to do that every five years. You want to be you want to be with someone for a long time, provided they're heading in the same direction as you. Yeah. Great, and uh, uh, Per Olaf, obviously, you, know, you you started this by saying that your uh, your company has a digital brain. It's it's based around that. Um, so, what, what's your what's your capacity to to advance uh, itself when that's the core aspect of your structure? Yeah, I mean, um, what I mean by that, and and I hear evidence from it when I hear hear uh, listen at Selma and Ellen as well that if you want to move forward, you cannot look back and, and, and see what has been working for the past 20 years because we have an exponential development when it comes to machine learning, when it comes to sensors, when it comes to uh, how we store data, how we can process data. We have quantum computers coming around and uh, with, with very clear advantages for big transport problems, for instance. Uh, within quantum computing, maybe within our careers, actually, uh, within a few decades from now, we will have really powerful solutions. So when choosing someone to work with, you should choose someone that has maybe not been around for five minutes, as Alan said, uh, but someone that is willing to uh, walk with you along um, some direction towards where you want to go. Because 
uh, I think it was Seth Godin who said that the map has been replaced by the compass. And, and I think that's a really good analogy. You need to know the direction. You need to know that you're going roughly west. But no one can foresee what we will be able to do in five years from now. It's virtually impossible to, to predict that. We can predict some things, but we, and we can predict the direction of involvement and evolution, but we cannot predict the end state. And um, this is something that's at, at our core. We are all uh, we are relentlessly moving towards our goals, which is an automated, fossil-free transport system. But there are many paths that can take us there. So, uh, when moving forward, those of you who are listening here, uh, pick a partner that has the compass that you are looking for not maybe the software that exists today, because software is what drives the world and software is evolving constantly, especially now when we are using data to feed back into the algorithms so that they will learn and become even more efficient in the future. So that, that's my message. Yeah, excellent. And touching upon, uh, it's quite scary, but also quite exciting to the reality of not knowing what's going to be in place in five years time. So. Uh, huge potential uh, and huge risk in, in equal measure. Uh, I've closed the poll now and I'll just address the first one. Uh, when does your company plan to have a fully digitalized supply chain? Uh, I asked you if you're, you're already there, um, one to two years, three to five years, six to 10, or never, um, Excel spreadsheets forever. Um, and 99% of you said uh, never Excel so spreadsheets forever, so we should stop this panel right now. Uh, no, of course, uh, I, I'm joking. Actually, no one said that. Um, but the majority did say three to five years, um, which I think is interesting with the, ro the rate of transformation in the industry right now. Um, what we're seeing with electrification, uh, autonomous vehicles uh, on its way. Uh, Alan, from your perspective, does that surprise you a little bit, um, that sort of timeline? Um, I think, does it surprise me that the, the majority of the audience answers three to five years, no. Um, do I expect that in three to five years, we'll still be saying two to three years? Yes. Um, and, and partly because we, we're, we're always much more optimistic about what we can achieve than, 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 than is real. Um, but partly to, to Per Olaf's point about maps and compasses, whilst we might think we know what we can fully digitise now, in three or five years' time, the world will have changed, technology will have evolved, priorities will change. And, and so we can expect that, that you know, in five years' time, there are more things that we can do to bring greater benefits or become more sustainable or whatever our, our objective is. So I, I don't think this is a three to five year journey. I think this is like most things, it's a continuous journey. But will we be 80% there in five years? I, I think many companies will. But if you'd asked your audience in 1980, how many of them would have fully integrated ERP systems in five years time, everybody would have said, yeah, me. And, um, and how many have got it? Probably none. So you're, so you're telling our audience that they're liars. Okay, that's a key message to take away. No, well, I, I'm, I'm just joking. Not, but thanks for that, Rich. <laughs> I'm just uh, just having some fun. Um, but I think it's a, it's a good point. Um, uh, and the challenge is meeting those, those ambitions. Um, and, and as Selma just uh, explained, there's some clear challenges. Um, and that's where Blue Yonder obviously can come in and support and make those ambitions uh, a reality. So, um, you know, there's, there's clear opportunity there. Uh, Selma, you touched upon um, decreasing downtime. And uh, I'm aware I'm approaching time, but I want to keep this discussion going for a little bit longer um, using my uh, moderator's prerogative. Um, yeah, downtime, um, particularly important for, for agriculture, commercial vehicles, but I think increasingly potentially in passenger vehicles as, as well. Um, due to uh, leasing models versus ownership, uh, just how much of a, a game changer do you think this will be? Uh, and, and as you said, putting customers at the, at the heart of these decisions. 
Yes, yes, for sure. In uh, our day by day, we use passenger vehicles and it's a big frustration when we have an issue. The problem is not when you have an issue with your product. It can happen. The problem is the time to fix. So, so in supply chain plays a very important, a key role in, the, in this uh, situation because uh, 90% of the times, it's a matter of changing one part. So for me, for us in CNH, this is uh, the, the most important decision that we, we take, we always take when we decide about investment is to be sure that our machines, our commercial vehicles uh, will be up and running. Uh, and if there is an issue, we should have the part available as close as possible of the customer. So, so the complexity behind is very, very high. And using now the capabilities of the AI, machine learning, uh, and all other possible algorithms help us to make the right decision. And this is something that is becoming true for us. And I'm pretty sure, as we discussed it before here, this is evolving very quickly. And uh, we need to do all the enhancements to be sure that uh, the, the uptime of the products, and then again, passenger vehicles is the same, uh, should be the first priority. Uh, absolutely. And uh, Per Olaf, maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask you to, to give some thoughts on, on this. And uh, transportation utilization, again, it's not just automotive you're working in. Again, you're really reducing downtime, is that the key? Um, and, and a real key benefit that digital supply chains can, can offer? Well, when I hear uh, also the optimistics of, of, of having a th three to five year until we, we are fully digitalized, never un underestimate the drag of sunk costs. I mean, things you've already invested in, they tend to be the most sort of rational thing to stick by when it comes to buying a truck or buying a car or whatever asset you have. So uh, we will see a long tail of old investments sort of dragged along here uh, for, uh, for the foreseeable future. But um, when we look at, for instance, the automotive industry and the servitization, uh, where less and less haulage companies want to own their trucks, they want to rent the truck. They want to rent the truck as a capacity that they have access to, like we rent songs on Spotify. And um, that will push the, the burden of maintenance, the burden of investments towards the automotive manufacturer instead. And I think that we will see different types of business models popping up. We have just seen the start of that trend uh, already. And what happens then when a haulage company does not own the truck anymore when the truck is owned by the uh, by the manufacturer well then the loyalty and the sunk cost fallacy will not be as strong for that haulage company they can just exchange that truck for another one and another one and another one um, because the, the the lease may not be more than yearly renewable or something like that so um I think that we might see some fast change coming along uh, when it comes to, because yeah, I, I'm talking about the transport industry because that's the industry I know about, but I think you can draw parallels even in other industries as well, especially those who are um, in, uh, have a high degree of, of fixed assets. Yeah, okay, absolutely interesting. Uh, another fascinating perspective. Uh, uh, just uh, just to touch upon the uh, the, uh, the last uh, poll that we uh, mentioned before, I maybe get some final thoughts and squeeze a few more questions in. Um, which trends are transforming your business the most over the next 24 months? Uh, the clear outlier is recovery from COVID followed by electric vehicles. Shared mobility, not so much. Uh, connected vehicles, not so much. Uh, I suppose perhaps uh, I'll ask you, Alan, digital supply chains, are they the answer uh, to help people through the recovery from, from COVID? I think they're part of the answer. Um, I don't think it's a panacea. Uh, I think, you know, the, there's, a, there's a lot of aspects of it and the recovery from, uh, fr from the whole pandemic is going through a number of phases depending on which industries you're in. And you know, if you're in consumer goods, which I know this audience isn't, there isn't really the same level of recovery to talk about. It's different. I mean, there is, there's been an impact clearly, um, but in automotive, you know, the, the, the near total shutdown of manufacturing on, on the OEM side is, is a huge recovery. And, and a lot of that is 
is, is human related and getting people back to work and safely and securely and, and you know, um, getting the, the business recovering from the, the financial challenges that they've faced over the, the years. So, yeah, surely uh, digitization can help. Um, but it, but it's not it's not all you know. There there will be some, so you know, straightforward hard grafts, sleeves rolled up to try and uh, recover uh, costs. Uh, you know, costs that have been incurred to uh, to address working capital investments that uh, may or may not have uh, been made. Um, you may have to replenish a whole load of, of uh, stocks through your network that have been de depleted because demand has remained strong while supply has, has gone away. So I think it's going to be a combination, but for, for sure we're seeing a lot of uh, businesses seeing the part that certain aspects of digitization uh, have got to, to play in, in the recovery around risk management and visibility primarily. Yeah, fantastic. Great, a great answer there. And uh, sadly, not the silver bullet, but a, a big part of it um, that uh, that's going to drive the industry forward. Uh, 30 seconds with you, uh, Selma. Um, a key takeaway for our, for our audience for, from your perspective for this session. Just your final thoughts, please. Okay, uh, I would like to, to thank everybody for, for listening. I would say that uh, we need to move to this digitalization, we need to move to the uh, new capabilities of the technology. The supply chain adds a lot of value in, in our industry, in the automotive industry, the, in the inbound, outbound, in the aftermarket, because we are in touch with the customers uh, and we deserve, we need to invest on in technology. Great, that's a, that's a good end, uh, good point to, to end on. Thanks, Selma. And um, Per Olaf, I'll give you the uh, the final, final say. Um, what do we need to do to embrace the digital age and, and stop solving problems like it's the 1990s, uh, no matter how good they are, they make us feel? Yeah, the computers are 5 million times more powerful now, according to Moore's law. So why stop at 1999? Well, don't be afraid to go digital and don't be afraid to start running in some direction because it was not better like it used to be. And the sensors, the computers, the algorithms, they are all evolving exponentially. So uh, find, find an actor that's um, moving fast in your field, follow them, try to copy them if you can, or uh, uh, become an ally to them and um, start running because the future is evolving and it will never be as slow as it is now. Great, fantastic. Well, some, uh, some fantastic insights and uh, thank you uh, to uh, all our panel there for, uh, for sharing um, not just their time, but their expertise and their insights. Uh, some real food for thought there about where the industry is going and what we need to do to make it happen. Um, <clears throat> so uh, thanks very much to them. Thanks to our audience for engaging with the polls. Uh, and uh, it, all it's left for me to say is uh, thanks for, for participating in this session. One more to come uh, and we'll see you shortly. Okay.